evening session, which promises to be maybe one of the most excited ones about one of the most important issues in the region of the Middle East. And uh, today we'll be talking about the new security architect in the Gulf. Uh, for that, I'm joined by prominent scholars and intellectuals. Uh, first and foremost, I start with Dr. Samuel Ketri, who is the president of uh, EPC, Emirates Policy Center, one of the leading think tank in the Gulf and the Middle East. And uh, she's a well-known figure uh, in her own as political scientist and also an expert on strategic issues. Of course, also I have with me uh, what we consider him in that world, our professor, our teacher, Dr. al Munam Saeed. We're really thankful that you're healthy and good uh, and uh, wish you the best of good health and, and luck as well. And thank you for insisting. Dr. had some health problems this morning, but he insisted to come and join the session. So please thank him for being with us. <clears throat> Very much appreciated, your Dr. Abdul Amirayim. And also, of course, our friend from ISP from Italy, uh, Valeria Talp Talput. Thank you very much for being with us, and we're going to rely so heavily on you to educate us about what Europe thinks of the security arrangements in the Gulf, and I'll come back to you in a minute about that. Now, I'm not going to take and or eat up the time. I'll speak one minute, and then I invite the speakers to uh, make their interventions. But there have been a lot uh, of very decisive, important developments in the Gulf region whether we're talking about the GCC countries, whether we're talking about GCC plus Iran, or even the neighboring countries to GCC. Uh, and by that, I include uh, Yemen and Iraq. And you can even think larger than that and bring the entire Levant. But if you think of the Red Sea, Egypt is a main player as well. So all of that, uh, we need to, Dr. Sam, I'll start with you, to decode to demystify if there is a new, and I underline a new, arrangements for security. And what is this uh, security architect at any way? And why Gulf, not the entire Middle East region? So would you please, Dr. Bissam. Uh, thank you, Dr. Zaid, and uh, thanks for the Delphi Economic Forum. Uh, for this chance uh, to speak about the Gulf. I would assume, Dr. Zaid, that this architecture always plagued with crisis. And who is the member of this uh, architecture? Since the, the, uh, the 70, with those uh, two pillars, Iran and, and Saudi, and, and with, with many wars, uh, uh, the momentum of uh, peace and reconciliation has grown in the Gulf and, and, and the Middle East as well, uh, most notably with the China, brought, uh, brokered the Saudi-Iran uh, deal in March 2023, making the resumption of diplomatic ties between uh, the two countries, and, and moreover, Washington, is focusing on China and Russia as a strategic challengers in the region. All of this raises the question about the likelihood uh, of a new security structure in the Gulf region in the light of a growing uh, tendency by regional parties for uh, dialogue, uh, diplomacy, de-escalation, a desire for uh, economic cooperation, and discussing controversial issues. Now, hmm. the year uh, 2022 ha has been repleted uh, with uh, practical steps by Washington and uh, regional partners to build a more cohesive, uh, partnership uh, uh, by Abraham Accord, forming or signing the Abraham uh, Accords. If it proves 
uh, effective and durable, such a regional uh, security structure could be a key factor in downsizing the US military uh, footprint in the region and increasingly uh, transferring a defense burden into local partners, which it was, in fact, also what Obama uh, seeked through the deal with Iran 2015, mm -hmm. that it will be uh, guilt responsibility, okay, by that because he thought that that deals will solve all the problem and the uh, Gulf will be a oasis of peace and uh, GCC can take care of them uh, selves. So the Abraham Accords uh, security and, and political impact align with uh, subtle shifts. The central, uh, the US central command is going uh, through aiming to enhance security cooperation with regional uh, partners and ultimately military integration with and among at least some of uh, them to safeguard collective security interests. Now, the China brokers uh, Saudi-Iran deal in March uh, 2023 was welcomed widely because it de-escalated the tension in the region. However, the actual judgment on the feasibility and importance of these talks is not about holding it, which is a positive indication, but it's resulting agreement. These agreements should allow cooperation between countries in the region and help solve crisis in Yemen, which did, I would say, temporarily now, yeah. and uh, Lebanon and Syria. A strong link between Iran's Saudi negotiation and developments related to Iran's nuclear issue is most likely. Now, what is the challenges? It is on the other side. Will Iran abandon uh, developing its uh, Silent affairs. Uh, nuclear. The program, nuclear program, the missile program, the drones no program, the militias and the proxies in the region. And this is, will show that if it continues. Now, we have seen this in Yemen, okay, but Every day we are getting different message from Houthi also, although this deal has been signed. But also my argument, if Iran is holding that strong card in its hand, will it give it easily to the Saudi or it will use it to blackmailing uh, uh, the Saudi for what is uh, its purpose? What does it need, which is need to open uh, the Saudi market and to break the isolation against us because of the uh, sanction. I know we'll stop. Excellent, so thank you. So this is, this is an excellent introductory to the topic. We're looking at it from regional lenses. So there have been development in the region among the players themselves and possibly there might be a kind of a new arrangements that is the architect where the states of the region are taking care of the security of the region. Dr. al what do you see in these propositions? Well, if the Sam said, says all those good things, <laughs> and uh, let me start by second her, her thanks for our host. And I, uh, I thank him doubly so because of uh, the care they have given me in the last few hours. Uh, I, I, I actually was very glad to have the previous session before ours about Europe coming in age, of age, uh, about the maturation of the European project. Because I think, you know, the major concept that I will borrow from political science is about regionalism, how regionalism works, how it comes about. Probably the most complicated, complex people who followed the European 
uh, project since the Second World War, probably since the Napoleonic War, uh, can really see how it evolved to this point of crisis and trying to solve the crisis and so forth. I think something of that is happening in the Middle East and in the Arab Middle East in particular. Uh, but uh, we are still in the Bronze Age, not on the Golden Age mm. yet. But the main thing in, uh, in the European experience is the maturity of the nation state. I mean, the beginning of the nation state. I mean, that's something that needs a, a big talking. How nation states are built now in the 21st century in the Middle East. What's happening in Saudi Arabia, what has been in Emirates, what's happening in Egypt, in, in all the countries, in Jordan, Morocco. Because here I will recall what Charles de Gaulle used to do with every guest who come and raise an issue. He immediately will ask his people, bring me the map. So we come into the geopolitics of what's happening in, in, in the region. And then how the geopolitics really get the regions together. What happened is the geopolitics is actually becomes a history when it is multiplied by events. So the geopolitics of the Middle East has a lot of events that started with the decolonization period until today. The big, big defining moment of what we have now, a big events happened <laughs> in the region in the early decade, second decade of the 21st century that called the Arab Spring. The Arab Spring, you know, shook the, the region, the world, and I think created the most significant and deepest way of thinking about the future in the region. Ten years later, we will have not only, uh, and, and, and rightly so, about the Ibrahimite uh, uh, accords, because actually part of the big decisions after the Arab Spring is that the Arab-Israeli conflict is not going to define what is the Middle East, or the Arab Medi Medi regional Middle East is. I mean, that is really separating between the Arab regional reforms that started in different ways, including uh, liberalization of the economy, looking at history, Every country in the world started to look underneath its soil, you know, as there was a history before the Islamic religion came to the region. And I will be very frank with that. Because the way uh, the Arab Spring uh, uh, put to the fore was that Islam is the beginning of our region. Another kind of religious nationalism, exactly like Arab nationalism, exactly like decolonization nationalism. Now we are into another kind of nationalism about how nation states are behaving. Looking at their interests, what are the sources of threats, how they will deal with it, how to keep economic, uh, you, know, uh, 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 you know, development working and working for the better, and also getting problems and trying to, to solve them. I mean, like Europe got detente, it got sometimes periods of Reconciliation with Russia, the Helsinki agreements that somebody denying wants not to want to talk about it. You know, we have a lot of things on, on the history of regionalization that's really, it's very dialectic in which people benefit from crisis and try to, to overcome it by much more, I will say, regionalism in a sense, get, getting together, trying to get away from the custodianship of superpowers, particularly whether Russia or the United States, because anyway, you know, both of them are, you know, they got their own realm or their own uh, uh, orbit that they work on it. Uh, it's sometimes very ambitious. MBS or Prince Mohammed bin Salman said, that the coming Europe is coming from the Middle East. He means that the coming Europe, not only in terms of industrialization, and we have, by the way, instead of the coal, uh, coal and, and, and steel as a kind of component of the European integration, uh, it's gas. And there was a session before 
about what's happening in the Eastern Mediterranean. Yeah. I think Eastern Mediterranean was a new kind of regionalism that is new for the Middle East. Okay. Also, I will say, you know, and we have with Ziad something about the new sham. Some of the concepts we tried and playing with, but the most effective, I think, was the Abrahamite Accords. It created not only the separation without really neglecting the, the Palestinian issue, let me put that on the record, but making and believing that it is not only there is a Palestinian question, but also there is an Arab question, about an Arab question of how to be under the sun, what to do for our coming generations. And for that, we have the internal politics. I think it took some stages. Ibrahimite, of course, was a good component of it. Uh, I believe the El Ola, uh, a statement that happened on the 5th of January uh, 2021 to break down what's called the, uh, the four Arab coalition against Qatar and Turkey and then try to build bridges. That generated also the Saudi-Iranian uh, talks. So there are more talkings. There are more also capabilities. The Gulf is central because now in terms, I will say, wealth, in terms of weaponization, in terms of military expenditure and, and so forth. Third, they have a much younger uh, and I will say mature generation of uh, looking at the world and looking at, at, at the Middle East All right. at large. The seminar. And I think now I will, I will stop the ad, sorry. Yeah, I, because I come again for uh, another round of intervention, but now Valerie and uh, Talbot. See, we're seeing some defining moments, events, if you wish, that might contribute to what a new architect for security would be for the Gulf. And not limited to Abrahamic, but also the emergence of regionalism. And Dr. Sam has shown us that there are certain trends are on set already uh, among the region uh, states. Uh, but, you know, she, she also should lights on to what extent some of the countries will live up to their commitments, including Iran and others. Uh, so, in, in your point of view, looking at, you know, how we seeing the security kind of dynamics for the region from within the region, and how we would see this in new arrangements as European looking at it from European eyes. Please. Thank you, thank you very much. I thank uh, to the organizer for having me. And from the European perspective, uh, uh, recent uh, uh, dynamics uh, in, uh, in the region uh, are very, very important because uh, the EU, uh, for, for the EU security and stability in the in the Middle East, in the wider MENA region, is a, a priority. So uh, from a European perspective, uh, all uh, this uh, uh, process of uh, normalization of the tent are uh, really very welcomed. And uh, uh, since the Abraham Accord, uh, uh, the Alula uh, Agreement, uh, and uh, then also all uh, um, steps that Country, uh, countries in the Gulf, but in the wider region uh, have been uh, uh, taken uh, since uh, the past uh, two, two years, uh, we, can, uh, we can say. Uh, because for, for Europe, uh, as I said, uh, stability and security is uh, a priority. And uh, uh, if uh, uh, Europe look at the Gulf, uh, Europe see that uh, the, the, the centrality of the Gulf in the MENA, in the MENA region. Uh, we have seen how over the past decade since uh, the Arab uprisings uh, uh, that marked a, a turning point for, for, the, for the region, what uh, happened in, in the Gulf uh, had uh, spillover effects in uh, the entire region and the consequences uh, also to, to Europe, so uh, for Europe, and 
stability is a priority and Europe as a, as a European Union and member states uh, worked and made efforts to, to play a role to support a process of, uh, of the tent. More recently, uh, the Gulf is central for uh, Europe because of uh, the security of energy supplies. Good. And I, that's I wanted to talk about energy too, so go ahead. Yes, because in, uh, in light of uh, uh, the war in Ukraine, the, uh, the Russian invasion, as, it, as we know, energy crisis w was a, a, a big, big uh, crisis for, for Europe, and uh, the need to secure new alternative uh, supplies to reduce and in the long run replace the, uh, Russia as a main oil and gas supplier was, was the, the, the urgent need. So uh, the EU look, looked at the MENA region as a whole, North African, of course, but uh, also and mainly to, to the, look at the Gulf. Here we know there are uh, um, more than 25% uh, uh, of world oil reserves, uh, uh, almost 40% of world gas reserves. So, uh, the need to secure uh, energy supplies and we, uh, was a major driver for, for the EU. And uh, we have seen over the past year uh, many officials uh, from uh, different European countries, uh, Italy, Germany, France, uh, uh, visited, uh, visited the Gulf countries uh, to a secure agreement. Sometimes they succeeded, sometimes not. <laughs> but uh, uh, the security of energy supply is, a, is the priority in the, short, in the short term. Excellent. This is very good. And I'll come back to Dr. Fissam. Well, look, Doctora. Now, forget about the uh, you know, regular formal language. I want Tissam. Kitri, as we know her, to say what she likes to say. So here's my challenge for you. There is actually no new or architect for security in the region. It is mainly same of the old and different dynamics. Because simply put, security of the Gulf is not separated from the security of the Middle East. More importantly, is not security without a guarantor. And we know who is the guarantor still. And I'm referring to the states. So what's this in new things? What's the newness in these arrangements? Now, there have been some developments, because these are political developments, not strategic ones, except, of course, for the Abrahamic. And Abrahamic does not mean it's a Gulf security issue per se. It's a larger Middle East uh, component. So. I, I'm simply saying there is no newness in the new, and there is no architect. It's all most, you know, of the same, uh, but in different dynamics. So what do you say to that? I agree with you. Uh, plus, I would say it w this is, but also it shows uh, U.S. failure, okay? Because U.S. tried to de-escalate. Okay. Okay. Through 2015, between the Iranian and the Gulf. Okay, it did not succeed because the the root cause is still there. Iran is still more. Uh, I mean, imbalance in the region is still there, and with this also, the new arrangement is still there. Iran is uh, uh, more powerful in terms of its. Uh, nuclear program, missile, drones, the militia. So this is, did not change. Right. Okay, what has been changed? That the two parties, the Saudi, the Iranian, that uh, the Saudi wanted an exit strategy from, from Yemen, 
okay? And this is cannot be without the Iranian because Houthi are, uh, uh, Houthi is proxy of right. the Iranian. So that was, won't be uh, not, not Lebanon, not Syria, right. was the main purpose of this de-escalation. Now, as you know, the Saudi and the Iranian, they are competing on a regional mm -hmm. one, okay? And this is present two different sects, okay? Saudi is the leader of the Sunnis, and uh, the Iranians are claiming they are also uh, the leaders of the Shia in the region. Correct. So was that competition before? Now the Saudi, they are claiming they are not anymore, okay, uh, the leaders of the Sunni. They want more, uh, looking for more uh, economic prosperity. They want to look inside, rather, outside. And they want peace so they can concentrate on themselves. So each one of them, and I said, Iran want to break the isolation because of the sanctions and to reach the Saudi market. But also I have to say something here. That deal, it was between Khamenei people and the Saudi. It is not be between the deep state, which is IRGC, and the Saudi. So that's why I'm saying this is a shaking deal, okay? It might not stay, okay? Maybe I would say, in a different way, this is marriage of convenience. Okay. okay? Can it last? And the other thing, the other factor, Dr. Zid, does this is done by the Chinese. Mm -hmm. Okay? And this shows also because this region always, always belongs to the America. And they are big allies. Now the Chinese is coming. Does it mean this is moving towards China? My guess, in terms of uh, security, Chinese, they want. They want to protect this uh, region. Now, this region becoming more important for the American, which they were about to leave that region and pivoting towards Asia, right. and that time, the region pivoted toward China. With the American going there, the GCC also moving uh, to China, having a new relation. Now, with the Chinese there, and the American looking to Chinese, this is also will not make the things stable. Also, the American watching, they are not pleased with, and the other things, the Negotiation with the Iran on the nuclear deal, where it will take? Uh, are they are going to reach a deal? No deal? And the impact of that? This is many issues. Uh, so this is making that this is an arrangement, not a security structure. Okay. Uh, well, thank you very much. This is very important. And let me reemphasize the following. Uh, I think very few will consider the Saudi-Iranian rapprochement as a game changer in the region, in the strategic level. It's a very important, significant step, but it's not going to change the security arrangements or balance of power, nor would it provide an decisive, a decisive mechanisms for solving for the region's other problems, including Yemen and others. And yes, you're right depending on who signed with whom and the future of the nuclear negotiations with the states and Europe, then the whole thing is up in the, in the, in the sky, it's not decisive. The other important issue that you also brought, Doctor, and I would like to pick up your brain, Doctor Armenet, mm -hmm. is this uh, Chinese option alternative. Well, my convincing is this. China, if want to, they can't do even if they want to replace, they can't replace from security strategic, yeah. uh, leave alone if they want it at all, or if the region is ready for this pivoting or replacements or alternative. So given all of that, Dr. al how, how you see the newness in this new architecture? 
Well, I see it that the word uh, game changer, I, I, I find it a little bit offensive to me. Oh? Offensive, in a sense that, you know, my study of history, particularly modern and contemporary history, there is nothing really is, is, is game changer in a sense that afterwards, you know, everybody will live happily uh, ever after. No, it, th there are tactical moves and there is strategic moves and there is in-betweens, a lot not only of 50 shades of gray, but I know 100 shades of all colors. Uh, countries get closer and get away from each other in degrees regarding the issue. The new thing is really is that the Chinese are coming without being communist. I really, in the last panel, I heard the idea of, you know, one of the biggest achievements of the globalization world was to integrate China into the world system. Sure. And after that, everybody was talking about how we deal with China and Volkswagen goes to China and the Apple computer is in China. I mean, I can't have it both ways. I believe that the biggest danger to our time is the idealization of the United States of America, turning liberalism into an ideology. Because the essence of idealism is accepting reason, accepting that there are different norms of evolution in the world. If we got that, you know, we can pick and choose what kinds of things that benefit the largest number of people. So there are those who want to shake the system overnight. I think we are moving faster. The history is not moving in the way it was moving in the 20th century. Now, technology is much faster and there is other things. But in the Middle East, I see the new, as I said, we are still in the Bronze Age, that it's fine. I mean, the whole globe of the South voted abstention regarding the Ukrainian crisis. China did so that. China announced over and over they are not going to give Russia weapons. Not because they cannot, because they are making a strategic choice about that globalization is really benefiting China but they wanted their own way, and here is competition. But that's in the global system. In the Middle East, the real danger is, is to get back the Middle East into the Arab-Israeli thing. Unfortunately, the Israelis are wanted to have the cake and eat it too. I mean, they got the normalization they want, even with countries they don't have diplomatic relations, they have relationships. A lot of things can mature over time, but the biggest, the biggest obstacle, the psychological biggest obstacle that everyone on the Middle East who rode in the 70s and 80s, the so-called psychological barrier has been broken. Yeah. As, as being broken, then Israel now is getting into very Salafism. I mean, taking Judaism as a Salafi movement. Really, I mean, how to control the, the, the Jews, how to control the Israelis, how to control the, re the, the region, how to put, you know, the Arab countries who normalize with them in a great embarrassment every morning day. So that is the Israeli danger that I think that needs to be dealt with as we deal with the European right or with the American uh, right or with really people like Putin and, and the likes of uh, 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 big adventurism in international politics. However, I will close again with the region. The, the region is advancing, and it's advancing because the nation state is getting consolidated. And nation states, despite the Emirates, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and stuff like this, we learn it from, from the Gulf. Historically, the Gulf was learning from, say, Egypt, Iraq, Lebanon, even. But now, the model of Dubai is a dream of every Arab country. We are in Egypt making cities to look like Dubai or look like the Emirates. Funded as, by as Dubai, a whole. too. What? Funded by Dubai, too. 
<laughs> well, good. Yeah, I mean, it's better than funding gate by buying you know, assets in the United sure, States no, or in Hong Kong or whatever. I mean, we have been, as a generation, calling for Arab money to be invested in the Arab money. So it's great. Uh, and we have a lot of crisis in Syria and Lebanon and now in Sudan. But I believe there is a, a good core, like the first six countries that really started the, e the EEC in the past. I think we have six countries that are making reform, and they are the ones that made peace with Israel. And I think they will devise strategies how to make, to harmonize all these things. Uh, and dealing with Iran in the same time. Yeah, okay. It might be, and I will tell to my European audience, the solution is to go nuclear like Iran. I mean, the West accepted the proliferation of nuclear weapons to India, Pakistan, Israel, and look the other side. So I think we can make a balance of power, a balance of terror in the region by which, but it will need a lot of cooperation. Uh, I see no one who really got nuclear capability came and put it away. The biggest lesson of all, Ukraine conceded for their, its nuclear weapons, and now see what's happening to it. Okay. Thank you very much. This is all important uh, takeaway, and I'll, I'll just highlight them again. Now, uh, Talbot again. Here's the situation. There is the assumption, if you wish, that Europeans always act as a free rider when it comes to the Gulf security. They wanted a stable, uh, secure region providing energy and oil, but they paying nothing almost, uh, little at best, to protect and keep the security of the region. Do you see this changing, given what is happening in the region these days? Well, uh, and you agree with the assumption, I assume. Yeah, I agree. No, I was thinking that the um, view was a bit uh, dormant, dormant, uh, <laughs> or say late, because, for example, it was yes. only you last. Have two minutes to finish. You want to yes. say something, Doctor? Just very, very no, quickly uh, to say that the EU uh, presented its strategic partnership with the Gulf last last year. And it, it is not a coincidence, uh, we know. And just a few days ago, uh, the high representative indicated a um, EU representative for, for the Gulf. And uh, uh, the point is that the EU is not a, a geopolitical actor. The EU has not leverage, the EU has a, is not a, a security uh, player. But and the point is that uh, um, if we look at the international players in, in the region, we see that not only there is a, a great difference between the EU and the US, but also between the EU and, and China. China signed its strategic partnership, uh, comprehensive or not, uh, with uh, uh, the MENA region after 2014. And uh, uh, there is a very strong uh, relationship. So the EU, uh, I think, came as come late. And in there, uh, it needs to, um, to uh, the, there is a need for a great EU efforts uh, if the EU want to play uh, a prominent uh, role. Okay. Well, thank you. We have a few seconds, so let me just sum up main ideas. So, Dr. Fissam's, uh, the what's happening in the region is not necessarily new, marriage of convenience, and it is hinged on so many other variables. And Dr. Abdul uh, Manaim, emerging of regionalism, but there is no sustained monopoly of nuclear weapon in the region, so we have to be careful to that. And uh, Europe is not a security guarantor, nor is a strategic player in the region or the region's security. Uh, I know this is a very complicated topic, uh, requires much more time, but thank you very much for your attention, for being here, and mainly uh, this topic to be continued, I think, at 8.30, with another session on Abrahamic Accords and his future. 
Uh, thank you, my very esteemed uh, speakers, and thanks to you too. Thank you. Thank you.